We have a couple of people coming in, and so we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Tonight we're talking about uh, the subject of Steps to Christ, and uh, let's bow our heads and let's get started. Father, we are thankful to be here to begin to think about the day that you have given to us that we can be together with you. And we just pray that as we enter the Sabbath hours, that you will bless our lives and that you will help us to be faithful to you. And Father, we also ask that uh, as we um, go over our subject tonight, that you will be with Paul and Matthew as they, as they uh, present their topic. And I just thank you for what you will do and how you will speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. evening. We'll share a couple notes out of Jeremiah, especially since we're beginning Steps to Christ tonight. Jeremiah 10 says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. There's a war raging right now all around us, and it's raging in our own lives. The war is over love, God's love. God's love was rejected by our first parents, which puts us into deep spiritual warfare from birth. As a result, God's love and fullness has been rejected by the masses for over 6,000 years. By the pagans, and even worse, by his own people. God states his people are worse than the pagans. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water. In order for us to choose the right side and to make the right decision in this war, we simply need to choose love, to choose God's love. It really is that simple. Let's think about what choosing God's love means. It means being at one with God Almighty. What a privilege. What an honor. Let's imagine this. Let's consider this. Let's do this. Let's become at one with God. I hope we work on this tonight as we do Steps to Christ. Either we do this or we will be overcome by evil. There is no other choice. The sooner the better. Everything else is a lie and a distraction to our true calling. Jeremiah also says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to go. To me, that sounds just like Matthew, our great gospel commission in Matthew. I ordained you to speak to the nations. In Jeremiah 29, God has a plan for our life. Very good plans. This world is desperate, desperate for soldiers. The few, the cho- chosen, will we join? Will we put all in? He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son has not life. Will we take a stand? Will we stand for Jesus? Amen. Thank you, Matthew. So tonight, we begin another adventure in the book Steps to Christ. How many of you have read the Steps to Christ? Okay, good. Um, I've mentioned that after the Bible, this is my favorite book. I buy it by the case, and I have lots of Steps to Christ stories. And uh, we'll see how many we can get to um, before we're done. Sunday night. The first chapter in Steps to Christ is what? God's love for man, yes. Until you know somebody loves you, why would you go to them? So she wanted to first establish God's love for us that would give us a desire to want to become acquainted with somebody who loves us. And so that's why it starts out 
God's love for man. And that uh, first sentence, second sentence, she says, our Father in heaven is the source of life, wisdom, and joy. So he's the source, which means that's the best. Life, wisdom, and joy. If we don't go to the source, we are more likely to receive death and foolishness and sorrow, right? Yes. So we want to go to the source, and we want life, wisdom, and joy. And then on that first page, she talks about creator. And that was the big thing for me before I became a Christian. Um, I wanted to know how this all got started, where it came from. Even as a little kid, third and fourth grade, I would walk outside at night and look at the stars and said, uh, what's on the other side of that? And what's on the other side of that? And then that. And how, how do you guys hang there? There's no strings or ropes. How do you, how do you, how do you stay there? A, a little third grader, I was starting to ask questions. And I'm saying, what, what are we doing here crawling around on this planet? What, what are we doing? It didn't make sense to me what we were doing. There had to be something bigger going on, and I just didn't know what it was. So um, I remember I was teaching a class in, uh, I think it was in California. The teacher there had a brilliant man. He had degrees in Harvard and, and uh, Virginia Mason and stuff. And when the students were dismissed from class, he said to me, um, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, uh, did I let it slip? And uh, he said, no, you, you didn't say anything about being a Christian because I try to be careful when I'm in public school uh, other than if I can prompt them to ask me a question. Um, if I can get them to ask me a question, I can answer it. And, uh, but I can't bring up a topic. But uh, I have ways now of knowing how to get them to ask me a question so I can give them a biblical answer. And then that tends to lead their little curious mind saying, well, are you a Christian? Well, absolutely I was. I am. You know, I, I wasn't raised that way, but I am now, and it has changed my whole perspective on the world and life and my future. I know what my future is. I'm not in uncertainty. So I try to answer the question as long as I can. <laughs> but uh, that's why the teacher always has to be present, and the teacher will testify he did not bring up the subject. He was asked by the students. And so anyway... He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, yes. Uh, how did you come to that conclusion? He said, just the way you handle yourself and the way you treated the students. I figured you were a Christian. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, well, I'm a Buddhist. And I said, really? I said, so what was it about Buddha that attracted you? And he said, oh, world peace. And I said, yeah, that's good. And I agree with that. Jesus even spoke about it. He said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. And I think that's good, but there was something bigger for me that was more important. And he said, what? And I said, I wanted to know who the creator was. Buddha does not claim to have created. Neither does Muhammad, and neither does Confucius or Hare Krishna, none of them. It seems to me, from all I've read, God drew a line in the sand and said, none of you will claim creatorship. I don't know any who claimed to create the universe. God said, I want to make sure that's not a line you cross because I want them to look for me, and I'm the only creator. You can't claim it. So I said the creator was the big one for me, and that really got him to thinking. Like, wow, I'm thinking of world peace, and he's thinking the creator. <laughs> yeah. So... That gave him a lot to think about. Anyway, it says in this chapter that God, uh, his desire is to make his children happy. And some people don't seem to think so, that God is a party pooper, that he's a spoil sport, that, you know, when I get old and I can't do anything, then I'll become a Christian. Um, but that's not the case. You have missed out on an exciting life of service for the creator of the universe because he does desire to make us happy. And I like this statement here. She says, love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. 
that was a challenge for me. Boy, I would like that to be revealed in every act of my life, but I know it isn't. And whether it's because of the bank or because of traffic, I know it's not revealed in every act of my life. I find traffic tend to be a pretty consistent one. If you want to find out if a girl is really deeply Christian, go on a road trip. <laughs> See her reaction. She has to drive. <laughs> Or you can take turns and pay attention when she's driving and see what happens. This next statement I really like, it says, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. You know, truth doesn't have to be spoken angrily or in a controlling way. Truth always should be spoken in love. And that's how Jesus spoke, and that's why people were one to him is because he spoke the truth in love, you know? It's true, you better not drink alcohol and you better quit smoking, but that's not speaking it in love. Speaking it in love is saying, you know, I have something better that you might wanna try, which is what Spirit of Prophecy tells us teaching the health message should be. Show them something better. Don't hammer on what they're doing wrong. Show them something better. And that's why in my seminars, I teach good, better, and best, is because I want to show them something better. So she says, he, he exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful kind attention in his intercourse with people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, but he did speak some severe words, didn't he? But not needlessly. Um, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness but he spoke the truth always in love. Wow, very good. Every person was precious in his eyes. Sometimes we think, oh, don't bother with them. Oh, stay away from them. No, no, everyone was precious in God's eyes. And so we need to have that same feeling toward everyone else. She talks about... <clears throat> the sin of separation from God. That's what broke his heart, being separated from God. And I've talked to friends of mine who have backslidden because I've been an Adventist for almost half a century now. And I want to ask them what, what happened because but by the grace of God, there go I. So it's, what, what was it that triggered your backsliding? Because whatever it is, I want to make sure I don't do the same thing. And... They'll often say, well, you know, I ended up buying another six-pack of beer, and then it went downhill from there. I said, no, I said, that's, that's not what triggered your backsliding. That, that was the result. That's what you did. Well, you know, I saw this movie on the marquee, and I recognized the actor, and I wanted to go see it, and then I ended up getting swallowed up into movies, and then it was nightclubs, and I just went downhill from there. And I said, no, no, that was the result of what happened, but I said, I wanna know what caused it. See, everybody always thinks it's the result that caused the backsliding. No, that's what you do when you backslide, but why did you backslide? People haven't thought that through. They think it was the extra case of beer or going to movies, going start going to parties again, or going on the wrong websites on the internet. And no, no, that's the result, that's what you did. And what you can always trace it to, and this is what I finally asked them, when was the last time you read your Bible? When was the last time you prayed? Yeah, because that's when you start doing bad things. When you commit sin, separation from God, that's when you commit sins, plural. All right? Sins is different than sin. Sins are what you do when you commit sin. You separate from God. Then the devil says, well, now that you're separated from God, what do you want to play with? I have a huge playground. You want over there, up there, up there, over there, whatever you like, I have it available for you. So we want to be careful that we don't commit the sin of separating from God because the sure results will be sins, plural, that we do because of the sin of separating from him. Morris Venden was very clear on making sure we understood that at PUC because a lot of young people don't understand that. And they think um, that the problem was the sins. No, that was the result of the problem. You separated from God. 
So that's why I'm repeating it over and over to make sure, as Morris Vinden did, he got the point home. Yeah. Don't separate from God because then there'll be sure disastrous results of sins, plural. Because the reason he wants you to commit sins is that you don't go back to God. He wants to keep it so exciting and so much fun and so interesting that you don't want to go back. But the problem was with me and a number of my friends, we had so, much, so many sins in our lives and it wasn't working. And we realized, is this it? Is this it? When uh, I started going to the Adventist church, it was a crusade I went to, and uh, Mike, my roommate, we were both life insurance agents, and we had way too much money for young men our age, um, but we were paid very well, and we lived in a very plush, uh, it was a, called the Swinging Singles Complex, called the Apple. <laughs> Interesting. But we had sand, volleyball courts, jacuzzis, whirlpools, saunas, entertainment center, wine and cheese parties, everything prodigal sons love. This was just a fancy pig pen. And uh, I started going to this crusade. Mike said, uh, well, why are you going there? And I said, Mike, um, all these toys are not working. I said, so in 10 years, instead of living here in Arizona, we'll live in Malibu. And instead of driving, driving Mustangs, we'll be driving Lamborghinis. He goes, ain't it great? He said, you know, people go to movies pretending they live like us. We're living it. This is our life. People go to movies wanting and wishing they lived like us. And I said, Mike, it's not enough. It's not enough. You know, I've got all the toys I want. I have plenty of money, drugs, alcohol, uh, ladies, you name it. So I said, it just gets bigger every year where does it end? This isn't working. And he goes, oh man, yeah, you just settle down, Paul. You'll, you'll see, this is, this is great. This is what people live for. And, and we're here, we have arrived and we're only in our early 20s. We have arrived in our early 20s. And I said, no, nah, it's not working. So I'll talk about this a little later. She mentions that we need to understand the exalted concepts of what we may become through Christ. Um, and that's really true. Uh, no matter how much attention, how many awards, how many recognitions people get, until they have Christ, they'll never be fully happy. And uh, that's another sh story I'll be sharing with you um, later um, uh, in a few days. So... She's thoroughly establishing the fact that God loves us. He wants our very best for us. And he will do anything and everything that he can to draw us to him. There'll be nothing left unturned in order to get him to pay attention, to see him. Sometimes it can be really good. Usually it's really challenging. It's a trial that brings us to God. Most people come to God because they're at the end of their rope. So the next chapter is the sinner's need for Christ. And in this chapter, um, she talks about disobedience. That's where the problem came in. And it goes through the story with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, I find it very interesting in Genesis chapter 3, when we look at the fall, are all these hymnals here or is there a Bible here? You know hers? <laughs> so let me borrow your Bible. Oh, okay. So in uh, Genesis chapter 3, at the fall, I want you to look very carefully at what God said. He asked Adam and Eve four questions. And we have to answer those questions ourselves today. What was the first question that God asked Adam and Eve? Where are you? Yes. God wants to know who we're hanging out with. Where are you? Are you in the nightclub? Are you in the bar? Are you in the movie theater? Are you at the carnival? Where are you? Good question, isn't it? Question I need to ask myself. 
am I in a place that I could enjoy also in heaven? Or would that not be in heaven? If it is, I'm in the wrong place. Second question, what did God ask? We're looking at Gen Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 9. What was the second question? Who told you you were naked? In other words, God wants to know who we're listening to. Are you listening to rock and roll? Are you listening to pornography? Are you listening to things that are not going to be in heaven? Better be careful who you're listening to. So first of all, God wanted to know what? Where are you? Second thing, who are you listening to? That's right. Third question. Have done. No, no, that's the fourth question. There's one more before that, and that will be the reason why they did what they do. What was the third question? Did you eat from the tree? Yeah. Did you eat? God wants to know what you're eating, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. And we've talked about that in the seminar. What you eat and drink today is going to walk and talk tomorrow. And I can show you that very clearly. And I talked to you about the Adventist prison in California, Maranatha, where they put them all on a vegan diet. I spent a week there at that prison. Terry Moreland gave me carte blanche. He said, Paul, you can go anywhere. You can ask any questions. I says, I want you to look over my prison. And first place I wanted to go was the kitchen. When I go to a prison or a drug rehab place, first person that I want to go talk to is the cook. He has more power over the actions of those men, than the warden, than the counselors, than anybody. Because what he's giving those guys is going to determine their behavior. And so I went into that Maranatha Adventist prison, and I opened every cupboard, every freezer, every... You could think that place was as squeaky clean as my own home. There was no irritating spices. There was no stimulants, no foods that would cause the body to want to overreact and behave in an unpolite or uh, dangerous manner. And I said, Terry, you're doing a good job. And he said, yes, um, our prison, when these men finish here, 75% of them never go back to prison again. That's unheard of. The normal prison is 75% return. But this Maranatha prison, you see, there's no TV in this prison. They don't want you to get stimulated. And when I say stimulated, I don't mean sex. I mean watching a war movie, watching cops and robbers, watching the detective things. You listen to that music, it's building up your nervous system because that's what they want. They want you to be excited so you watch it next week and the week after and the week after. That's what it's all based on. They're buying you. You think you're buying the TV? No, no, they're buying you. And then they own you. And once they own you, you don't know how to behave because as you behold, you will become changed. So God wants to know where you're at, who you're listening to, what are you consuming? And from those three, he will ask the final question, what is this that you have done? Yeah. Because where you're hanging out, who you're listening to, and what you're consuming is going to determine what you do. Ever thought about that? Big questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask our kids. We need to ask our friends. Because we want to be sure they're doing the right things. And Adam and Eve chose the other. So they were hiding, weren't they, Adam and Eve? How do we hide today? You don't have to confess that it's you. Well, it's my sister. This is how she hides. So tell me how your sister hides. Or your uncle. What did you say? At work. At work. People hide at work, don't they? They're called workaholics. They hide there. They don't want to face life. They don't want to take responsibility. They just put their nose to the grindstone. The sad thing is, when they're on their deathbed, that's when they say, I wish I'd have gone on a few more vacations. I wish I would have been there for my children to raise them. Yeah, workaholics. Why else do we hide? I can tell you where our teenagers are hiding right now, and it breaks my heart. This little box. And they spent more time there 
than any previous generation in front of a box or a screen. That's why the American Psychiatric Institute said, under the age of three, a child should never see a screen of any kind because they learn to bond to the screen. And when you come in, you are an interruption. Wait, I'm watching this, my master. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to you before, it makes me sad when I walk on, walk on high school campuses to do lectures, none of the kids are having fun. None of them are enjoying each other. They're all bent over looking in a box and it's dead silent like a ghost town. And I'm going, you kids have no idea what life is because all you're doing now is observing it. You are not living life. How sad. And they don't even, they're like the frog in boiling water. They don't know the water is boiling. Yeah. And I'm saying, you guys, do you realize you don't have a life? Do you realize you have no, these people in this box, when you're hurting, when you're in trouble, when you have a need, do you think they're going to show up? Of course not. You need to have contact with real people in the world that God brought you into. That's your real world. It's not the box. But people live there and they can't get out. They can't, they don't want out. There was a reality program that was on a number of years ago. I was hoping I was going to catch on. I don't know where I saw it. I must have been visiting my dad because I don't have cable. But I was uh, visiting my dad, I think is what I saw. And what they do, um, it was a very brilliant idea. And I'm sure it got squelched by the industry. But what they do is they take a family. It has to be at least four or five, uh, including teenagers in the group, before you can qualify. And then for this reality show, if you qualify, you are sent out into the woods. I mean, everything's there, electricity, water, and all that kind of stuff. It's not primitive, but there's no electronic uh, anything. No computers, no cell phones are allowed. And um, I actually got to see a couple of the episodes, and I thought, man, this is wonderful. They need to show this at every high school and middle school and elementary school. And the first three or four days, the teenagers are hysterical. They're pouty, they're cranky, they're angry. They want to go back home, and they said, you know, uh, this, is not, this is not how I live, you know. And, and, but they had assigned the contract, that they agreed to stay 30 days here, you know. And so the parents keep saying, you know, we're getting paid $50,000. We're going to see this through. Just think what you can buy when we get out of here, you know. And they, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So they continue the thing. Every single one of the episodes that I saw at the end of the 30 days, the young people said, um, this was the biggest and most important move of my life. And I will never go back to letting those electronics control me again. I was lost in a world that was doing nothing for me. They said, our family has come so close. I didn't realize how much I had missed my father. I loved my mother because we started talking and looking at each other and communicating. Every one of them said that. Yeah, wouldn't that have been amazing if that would have been a number one show? Yeah, but I, I have an idea that the people who aren't interested in that got it canceled. Got it canceled. But it would have been a great, great witness, I think. Now, she says, um, it is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. So why don't I give up? <laughs> If it's impossible for me to get out of here, she goes on, our hearts are evil. We cannot change them. Yeah. I mean, you can change your clothes. You can change your hairstyle. You can change your diet, hopefully. You can change your car. But there's one thing you cannot change, and that's your heart. You are incapable of doing that, which means you've got to go to the one who can. You need to find someone who can. Too many of our young people are trying to change their heart. They're frustrated, they're discouraged, they're angry because it's not changing. Yes, because you can't change it. You've got to find someone who does. And the only one who can change the heart is the one who created it, the one who made it. You've got to go to the creator in order to recreate your heart. She says there must be a power working from within, a new life from above before man can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. This is a supernatural work. You need supernatural help 
you cannot do this. You're limited, but God is unlimited. And then she shows the statements from Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to deliver me from this body of death? He was a frustrated like our teenagers are. Who's going to deliver me? And then he says in John chapter 1, John does, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Did you catch that? Sin singular. It didn't say he takes away the sins of the world. He takes away the sin. What is the sin? The separation from God. When you take away the sin, the sins disappear. You've got to take away the sin, being separated from God. Then the sins are gone. They're done. This is just so clear to me. It's so wonderful. This can get so many of our young people out. Of, I, had, I did a week of prayer at Mount Pisgah Academy in, in North Carolina. And uh, the first, actually, I did two Friday nights. It was so overwhelming, they canceled their week of prayer speaker and asked me to take over because the students were so responsive. They were telling me the first Friday night, I said, how long do I have? And they said, only about an hour. After that, they're out of control. I was there with two hours with them. And the dean said they weren't even breathing. They were so captured by what you had to say. They said, this, this is true. This is what I need. This is what I want. And so we did that. It was amazing. It was a wonderful week of prayer. And then the other academy had me for a couple of days also. Fletcher, yeah. But they were going to keep their week of prayer speaker. You know what their week of prayer was? Steps to Christ. You know what my week of prayer at Pisgah Academy was? Steps to Christ. <laughs> So, we have got so much help on our side, it's virtually impossible for us to lose if you go to the help. We've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, angels. How could we lose? We know there's only a third of the angels left heaven. So, you've got two to one angels against the enemy right there. You've got them outnumbered. And then you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you go to these sources, you can't lose. You, can't, you have all the power. I mean, they're the only ones that are omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. The demons are not. So you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I have a question you still have. Uh, I believe the Father, our Creator, replaced those third of hell and replaced them. With what? More, more angels. Now, some people have suggested it's going to be with us. <laughs> Did I do that? Yeah. Stand back. <laughs> All right. So the next chapter is repentance. This is our first step to Christ is repentance. Chapter one, God's love. Chapter two, the sinner's need. Chapter three, let's get busy. Here's your first step, repentance. And she makes it very clear. Repentance includes a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. It's not enough just to be sorry. Something has to happen or you're going to be sorry tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Being sorry is not enough. You have to have a turning away from it. Multitude sorrow that they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. It's not that you're fearing you're going to get punished. You're repenting because you hurt someone who loves you more than anyone else. And that's what really hurts and breaks your heart, is that you're hurting the one who created you, the one who loves you, People say, well, exactly how do I repent? What do I say? What do I say? Well, I tell people to go to Psalms 51. This is the repentance prayer of David after the incident with Bathsheba. Psalms 51. I can't be doing that. Is that going on in the booth? I'm standing completely still and it's crackling. Did you have Rice Krispies for dinner? We had waffles, so it couldn't be. Something's going wrong here. Do I need to put this on my tie, maybe? I don't drink my ties anymore. Yeah, I guess you could have a virgin one. Virgin pina coladas. Those are good, virgin pina coladas. I like the pineapple coconut one. Yeah. 
virgin means no, no booze. Okay, that's not working either. What? I know that it must sound a bit worse out in front of you guys to having to hear this noise. All right, so get a good look at Psalms 51. That'll give you your outline. She says, if the sinner does not resist this love of God, he will be drawn. God is like a giant magnet, and you're a metal person. He's like an electric magnet. If you don't resist, he's going to keep drawing, drawing, drawing. Just don't resist. Now, the way we resist is we go hiding so that the magnet can't draw us. We don't want to go hiding. <clears throat> and when I hear people saying, you know, my life is miserable, I'm not happy, I feel incomplete, she says, you in heart long for something better than this world can give you. Recognize this longing as the voice of God to your soul. That's why you're frustrated. That's why you're upset. Is because God is calling you and you're trying to resist. Ask him to give you repentance. If you don't really think you know how to do it, say, God, give me repentance. I, I can't, I don't even know what it is. The outline in Psalm 51 will help you. But ask God, give me repentance. Give it to me. I, I, I can't conjure it up. He will. To reveal Christ to you as his, in his infinite love, in his perfect pu purity. So, ask God for repentance. Now, people say, well, I'm not such a bad guy. I don't think I need to repent. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> you say, well, I've never robbed a bank. I've never shot anybody. I've never stole anything. Well, listen to this. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven. While pride, that's a big one, selfishness, oh yeah, covetousness, too often go unrebuked. But these sins, these are the sins that are especially offensive to God. Oh, I thought it was the murderer. No. Pride, selfishness, and covetousness. These are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character. This is where you're going contrary to God's character. Yes. So, pride feels no need. You don't, you don't feel a need for God if you're doing wonderful. And so, people don't ask for repentance when everything's going good, and they're proud, and they're selfish. But these are the ones that we really need to be aware of. Yeah, that's right. So she's saying we have to come to Christ just as we are. Now, I heard a conference president say this once at camp meeting, and I really had to wrap my brain around it. He said, God does not accept you as you are. And I went, what? He said, no. God cannot accept sin. He receives you as you are, but he does not accept you as you are. That's why he wants to see you change. And so you've heard people say, well, I don't care. God accepts me just as I am. No, he doesn't. He does not accept you as you are. He'll receive you, but he will not accept you. He cannot accept sin. So people think they're doing fine uh, because God says, he knows I'm weak, and, and so, but God accepts me just like I am. No, he doesn't. Think about that. And then let me know your conclusion. I've been thinking about it for a number of years now, and it made more sense to me what he said. He'll receive you, but he doesn't let you stay the same. If he accepted you, he wouldn't have to change you, would he? But he does not accept you. Sin is unacceptable to God. You're not acceptable, but you're receivable. He will receive you, and then... He will begin both to will and to do of, your, of his good pleasure. That's when you start to change. Yes. So, interesting thought. But it's one a lot of young people and adults hide behind. Well, it doesn't matter what I do. God accepts me just as I am. Mm, think about that. Yes. Uh -huh. 
And fortunately, God um, received him, but he didn't accept him. When you think about that, that's really true. So when you hear people say that, you just may want to tell them and say, do you think God accepts sin? Is that acceptable to God? Well, no. Well, if you're a sinner, you're not acceptable because he doesn't accept sin. It's not acceptable to God. And, but he receives you. Yeah. She talks about beware of procrastination. And there are a lot of people who do this. You know, uh, well, you know, tomorrow is going to be just like today. I'm just going to keep going ahead. And then when I get into a really bad spot uh, or I can't do any more sinning, then I'll, I'll go to God. <laughs> yeah. Procrastination. What you've really missed out on is a wonderful, exciting life with God. I feel sorry for the people that come in at the last. Some people say, oh, that's not fair. You know, like the man who was hiring the servants and the ones came in at the last hour, the ones who'd been there all day. Well, they weren't really working for the master. They were just working for the money. And that's why they were complaining that they got the same amount. But they weren't working with the master. They weren't enjoying all the privileges. I only regret when I became a Christian that I didn't do it sooner. That was my only regret. Yeah, they, well, look at all the fun you missed out on. I didn't miss out on anything. Look at all the friends you lost. I didn't lose one friend when I became a Christian. You never lose a friend. Yeah. You lose drinking acquaintances and, you know, fighting buddies and stuff like that. But you never lose a friend because they see you're a better person. In fact, when I was baptized, a friend of mine came down to visit me. And uh, when she came down in Arizona there, um, I said, uh, Sherry, I need to tell you something. Uh, things are a little different in my life. And she says, what's that? I'm preparing to get baptized. And she goes, you are. I mean, I was the party animal, you know. And uh, I said, yeah, my life has changed. And she goes, wow. Well, okay. So anyway, we hung around with each other for a week or so before my baptism. And then the baptism, she came to church. And um, people were shaking, you know, your hand, welcome you into the church. But Sherry stood over in the back under the balcony. And so after I'd shake welcoming, you know, I went back there. And as I got closer, I saw she was crying. And I said, Sherry, why are you crying? And she says, you know, what I saw today, I want in my own life. And I know I don't have it. And she said, uh, I also know, having been with you this last week, that you're not the Paul that I went to high school with. He's gone. And I'm going to miss him because he was a lot of fun. But I think I'm going to like the new Paul even better. Yes. People should see that change. They should see that repentance that you've had in your life. And she saw it. And then when I went back home to Alaska, all of my friends were just startled at how I had changed. They really saw it. You, you are really different. You have really changed. So I said, wow, God, <laughs> you're doing something I'm hardly even aware of myself. Because once you fall in love, you don't worry about all the details, you know? For me, it was like uh, my sins were like a backpack, just loaded with all kinds of stuff in there. And uh, as I continued to have my devotional life and Bible study and prayer, God would reach in the backpack and pull it out. I wasn't even aware of it. When I had my last cigarette, I did not know that was my last cigarette. When I had my last beer, I did not know that was my last beer. In fact, I remember going with a friend shortly after I baptized, and we were at a party. Someone says, uh, do you want Michelob or do you want Heineken? And I said, oh, no, thanks. I don't drink anymore. She turned and she goes, when did you quit drinking? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I was as surprised as she was. It came up, that, that was me? Who's the ventriloquist? How did this get out of my mouth? You know? But it was because I was heading toward Jesus, and he was putting his arms around pack of out of my life yeah it's not as big as a struggle your struggle is to have the devotional life that's the struggle and we'll be talking about that more tomorrow um, where the battle is people are not fighting the battle where the battle is they're losing because the battle there you got to go where the battle is you know and she says the warfare against self is the greatest battle we will ever fight that's the battle so you need to know where it is and how to arm yourself to win. Amen? All right. Now I'm going to 
read you the statement. I want you to tell me what you think is the critical word in this sentence, okay? And I'm going to try to say it in a monotone so I don't give it away, but maybe that'll be a little difficult. So here's the statement. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire persistently cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Now, which word is the standout word to you in that sentence? <laughs> huh? There's some big words in there. Yeah, you got to weigh them all out, but the pastor's wife nailed it. Tell them. Cherished. Cherished. Yep. You see, most people think, oh man, if I got one sin in my life, I'm going straight to hell in a handbasket. No, no, no. Listen to what she said. She says, one wrong trait of, uh, of character, one sinful desire persistently cherished. You see, if you, I don't care if it's one or 20. If you cherish it, you will neutralize all the power of the gospel. But if you don't cherish it, then the power of the gospel can come in. But as long as you're cherishing it, you love this, it's your darling sin, and you enjoy it, that will neutralize all the power of the gospel. When I was at the academy, you know what all those academy kids said? One, one, and I know I got one. Yeah, don't focus on the one. Focus on are you cherishing it, not the number. It's cherishing it. That's the factor. If you cherish it, God can't take it away from you because you're hanging on to it, aren't you? This is mine. You know, I'll quit someday. Procrastination we just talked about. Mm, someday may never come. And then she quotes again from Psalms 51. Uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. So... Who do we have to go to for a clean heart? Who do we have to go to for a right spirit? Hello? Yes. Quit trying to do it on yourself because you'll be discouraged and you'll leave the church because you're trying to do it yourself and you can't. You can't. You're trying to do a natural battle with a supernatural element and it's not going to work. You need supernatural help to get over this supernatural power. Now, I like this one and... Uh, I remember hearing this in college. Somebody made this statement. When Satan comes to tell you that you are a sinner, look up to your Redeemer and talk of his merits. And this one preacher in college said, when something, Satan comes to tell you you're a sinner, agree with him. <laughs> There's no argument here. You're right. I am a sinner. Now get the topic off of you and start talking about your Savior. All right? He wants you to keep the topic on you because you will be overwhelmed and discouraged. So when he comes to tell you you're a sinner, you say, that's right. But greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah, hark the herald angels sing. You just keep throwing God right in his face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get the subject off of you. You're the problem. You're not the solution. You need to get the topic on the solution. And when you keep talking about God, he just gets so frustrated because he can't get you to focus on you because he knows if he focuses on you, you're overwhelmed you focus on you get that conversation off of you you get it right onto christ the solution yeah don't let him let him talk about you you know mm. exactly what well sure it was everything about him yeah and the same thing with eve well hot mama welcome to tree life <laughs> yeah all right confession confession. She says, um, he that confesses and forsakes his sin shall have mercy. There's an and there, isn't it? What's the and connected to? Yeah. Confess and forsake. You don't just keep coming to confession every day or as my Catholic friends every week. No, it's not the answer. And they, I tell you, my bless their hearts. This is all they knew. But they said, man, I got to get, I get to get to confession before I get in a car accident and die. Because if I die before I get to confession, you know, of course, then if they're still breathing, they can have the last rites. But what are you doing? You're playing a hot tag game with God. Don't do that. You know, why would you live so dangerously? So we need to confess and forsake, and then we will have mercy. And then she talks about different kinds of confession. 
some confessions nobody needs to hear. Unless they're part of the problem or part of the solution, you don't need to talk to anybody else about that. When I pastored my first church, we had gossips in the church. The pastor, those are the first ones I'd like to disfellowship. I am more fearful of a gossip than I am a drunkard. I am. The gossip will do far more damage to the church than any drunkard ever will. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> when one of the little hens, oh, Paul, you need to pray for Martha. You know where I saw her last Tuesday night? Well, how did you see her? <laughs> exactly. So when they get ready to tell me the little juicy, this, you know, it's called a vegetarian um, gossip, you know. You need to pray for Tom. Last night, I said, wait a minute. Am I part of this problem? Oh, no, Pastor. You didn't do this. And I said, okay, that's good. I said, am I part of the solution? Well, well, no, his wife has to. And I said, then we're done. We're done. If I'm not part of the problem, if I'm not part of the solution, count me out. I don't, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. You go to the people who are part of the problem or part of the solution. I'll go with you if you want to. But don't come to me if I'm not part of the problem or the solution. You need to go to the sources. And I will take you there if you like. If you're a little timid to do that, I'll help you. Because we do want to get to a solution. But the solution is those parties involved. It's not the other church deaconess, and it's not the other church elder that needs to know about this stuff. But some people get a gambler's thrill off of spreading that gossip. Yeah. So maybe confession that you and God only. There may be an injured party, and you need to go to them. That's one-on-one. -on -one. You may have done something public that you need to apologize publicly about it. So those are the three stages. And I feel so sorry for these people who do these public confessions that shouldn't be doing that. People don't need to know this. They were not involved. They didn't need to know this because when you confess something like that is shameful and embarrassing, it's hard for them to forget that. And they will always look at you as, that's the one who molested their little girl. That's the one who cheated on his wife. That's the one who did this and did that. You just can't erase that. That scar has been put in the brain, and it's never erased. And people will always have a difficult time with you. So you don't do these horrific confessions unless an individual is involved, and then you do it privately. So those are the kinds of confessions that we have to be careful about. And uh, don't let the gossip train take off. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be decided changes in your life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. And I also wrote in every one offensive to God must be put away. When I was a new Christian, I knew there were certain people and places I needed to stay away from. And so I drew the line. Granted, I got criticized even by my parents. Oh, he's too good to go there anymore. He doesn't go, he doesn't do movies anymore. He doesn't go, you know, well, you know, go ahead and ridicule me. Would you rather I come home drunk with a car smashed up? Yeah. Think about the alternative. And so, but what they're, what they're really saying is, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable and guilty because I know I shouldn't be doing this either. That's what they're really saying. And really bad behavior, you have to remember, is a cry for help, not more badness and criticism from you. Bad behavior is a cry for help and recognize it as what it is. And the reason they're behaving badly is because they haven't seen Jesus. And if you get angry at them for their bad behavior, are they seeing Jesus? No, they're not. The only way they're going to get out of the bad behavior is you've got to show them something better, and that's Jesus Christ. You show them something better, and they'll respond. Wow, you're not mad at me? No, I'm not mad at you. I'd like to help. Really, what will help? You know. And I often just tell people, read Steps to Christ. If you want and you're not disciplined enough, call me up and read it to me over the phone. I'll listen. Hmm. Yeah. Get your steps to Christ going. And then the last statement on this chapter of confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. Yes. So... Where am I at here? 7.30? Is that what it is?
Yep, okay, half an hour. All right, next chapter is consecration. Now we're going a little deeper, okay? We've repented, we've confessed. Now we're going to consecrate. This is a serious commitment. This is usually where baptism should come in. When you're consecrating yourself to God, you're making a commitment that you want to stay here. You want to be here. You've confessed, you've repented, your slate is clean. Now you're ready to consecrate yourself to God. And she says, the whole heart must be yielded to God or the change will never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored into his likeness. Don't give God partial surrender. Anything you hang on to is going to hurt you and everyone around you. You've got to give it all to the Lord and he'll accept it. And this is the statement I mentioned earlier. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. And I'll tell you what that warfare is. The biggest warfare you will have is to consistently have a daily devotional life. That is your biggest battle. If you can win that battle, all the other battles are in God's hands, right? That's why, and I'm going to say this again tomorrow too, and I repeat this often. When I looked at those Ten Commandments as a new Christian, I said, okay, God, you're a God of order. Why is number three, three? Couldn't it have been number seven? Number eight, couldn't that have been number one? Or number two, could that have been number five? Why did you just this specific order? And as I began to look about it and think about it, a light went on in my head for the first commandment. It has to be the first commandment. What does the first commandment say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I get up in the morning and would rather watch Good Morning America instead of Good Morning Jesus, what may be my God? Could be that television, couldn't it? If I would rather rush off to work and have no time for Bible study and prayer, what may be my God? My job, yeah. If I'd rather finish my homework and rush off to school, homework, school may be my God. God says, keep that first commandment. Have no other gods before me. Make me first in your day. Then you have given me permission to carry you through the next nine commandments. That's why the first one is first. You have to give him permission to carry you through the next nine. And he will. If you have no other gods before him, he is first and best in your morning. God can turn to Satan and said, you're done here. And he knows that. He has to walk away. Because he knows you committed yourself to God. And God will pick you up. Satan can't knock you down when you're in God's arms. He wouldn't dare. He wouldn't come close. God says, this is my child, and I'm carrying him through the next nine commandments. That's why I love that story. It thrilled me, drew tears in my eyes, footprints in the sand. You remember that story? Isn't that just an amazing? I met the lady who wrote that. She's a Canadian woman, and I heard it at Canadian camp meeting, and she said, yes, I am. They'll tell you it's anonymous, but it's not. I wrote that. Yeah, Canadian woman, Adventist. Adventist woman. She wrote that. And when I saw that, I thought that is just one of the most amazing, touching stories I have ever heard. That's when I carried you. You aren't walking alone. Those were my footprints. And that's what the first commandment says, huh? You don't have to make footprints anymore. I'm going to carry you. Those will be my footprints from now on. You'll be safe in my arm. You know, what does he say? Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Isn't that right? That's right. So when you're there in God's arm because of the first commandment that you kept, having Bible study and prayer, Satan is done. He can't touch you. He wouldn't dare. You're in Jesus' arms. So that's wonderful. I was so happy when I discovered the first commandment for a reason. It's because he wants to take us to the next nine. And that will be your biggest battle. Your biggest battle will be to have a devotional life. And that's why I was so grateful. When I was a brand new Adventist, I went to PUC. Because when I got baptized, I told you I was a life insurance agent. I had way too much money for somebody my age. And so I said, well, I, I need to do something with this money. I want to go to a Bible college. So I asked the people at church, do we have Bible colleges? I said, yeah, we got a dozen of them in North America. And I said, well, no. First they said, yeah, we've got PUC because Arizona goes to PUC, California. And that's the only one I knew about. I knew about uh, PUC and uh, SMC. 
Southern Missionary College. I think that was the only two they told me about. I didn't know about the others. I would love to spend a, a year at Oakwood. They said, you go to Oakwood for one year to get the spirit. <laughs> I think that's really true. I would have liked to, if I had to redo, sophomore junior year would have been at Oakwood. I guarantee you I would have gone there. Yeah, I went on a retreat once with Oakwood Union College, Atlantic Union College, and Columbia Union College because I was a student leader. And we have retreats at the end of every school year. All the student leaders from all the colleges come together and uh, we start sharing ideas, what worked and what didn't work, you know. There's usually about, oh, 100 of us or so, all the student body officers and, you know, people who are doing on these different committees. And so, um, yeah, I had the Friday night talk. I don't know how I was, I was selected. I don't know how they figured all this stuff out. But we got four colleges there, and I was selected to have the Friday night talk. And then they said, no, you have to be done by 8 o'clock or 8.30, you know. And I said, okay. So I was making my presentation there with Oakwood Atlantic Union College, Southern Missionary College, and, and uh, Union College from Lincoln, Nebraska, where I was. And it's starting at about 8.30. And I said, well, I said, I think now we have to uh, <laughs> wrap it up. And my Oakwood brothers and sisters, come on, Paul, come on. We're not done. <laughs> come on. <laughs> And the director said, well, we need to break up now. And they said, we can go in the cafeteria. Well, you can turn your lights out here. We're going to the cafeteria. Come on, Paul. <laughs> bring it home. Bring it home. Come on, bring it home. <laughs> it was really quite interesting. But I enjoyed it very much. But that's what we kept stressing. You've got to have that daily devotional life. You know, everything else is peripheral. Everything else... Uh, isn't going to give you sustaining power without the daily devotional life. You've got to have that. And uh, you nail that down, which is what I did at PUC my first year there. Morris Venon, his, his motto was time alone at the beginning of every day with Jesus. And then you need to tell somebody about that. You can't just keep it to yourself. Because God sees if you're a closed vessel, you don't get any more. But if you're an open vessel, he's going to keep filling you. You just need to keep pouring out so you get more. And that's how it works. So that, that rock got me right there. And uh, I'm going to give you a challenge tomorrow afternoon after potluck. Or we're not having a potluck. We're having a picnic. <laughs> Sack lunch. And, uh, and I'll take you through that process as well. So uh, she talks about whatever will draw the heart away from Christ must be given up. And I also put in whoever will draw away your heart from Christ must be given up. Yeah, no thing and no person is worth eternity. No one, nothing, nothing. And I tell people I've simplified my life. There's only two things in my life that are important, God and people. Everything else burns. Is that right? Yes, everything else burns, yeah. God and people are the only two important things. And if you figure that out, your life becomes so simple, so simple. But don't you want that? Oh, the only thing that's important to me is God and people. This stuff can come and go. It's going to burn. So get that straight. That will help simplify your life. Now, I actually only have two goals in my life, too. Isn't that funny? I don't know why two always shows up. I said, Lord, shouldn't it be three? That's a <laughs> biblical number here. But I found out I really only have two goals in my life. My first goal is found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That goal is I want to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. That's my first goal. My second goal in life is to help somebody else have that same experience. Those are my only two goals. Life is simple. Just those two, I'm happy. That's all I want. Yeah. Yeah. But the advertisers will tell you otherwise. Oh, you need this, you need that, you need, yeah, it never ends. Yeah, okay. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. We are not God's children unless we are such entirely. Hmm. Those who can feel this constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. Amen? Yeah. And what I focus on, this whole book's called perfection. And that just 
overwhelms people. Oh man, nobody's perfect, you know? Be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. My goal is, what I wanna be perfect at, is my relationship with Jesus. I want to have a perfect relationship with him. Then he takes care of all of the other activities. But as long as I focus on my perfection is to have a perfect relationship with him, because the great controversy was over a broken relationship, wasn't it? With Lucifer. So if that's the great controversy, then the solution to the great controversy is the healing of that relationship. I was born broken, so were you. We were born separated from God. We have to make a choice in life when we come to the age of maturity to make that choice to heal that relationship. So I believe people say, oh, this is important, this is important, this is important. I said, that's not the great controversy. You need to focus in on what the great controversy is. The great controversy was a broken relationship. The end of the great controversy is going to be the healing of that relationship. Amen? Yes. She makes this statement, what do we give up when we give up all? And you know, you hear people say this, well, how much do I have to give up if I become a Christian? Do I have to give up this? Can't I wear this? Can I go here? Can I eat that? Really, do I have to give up that too? You haven't been converted, have you? Because a converted person isn't going to nitpick over every single thing that they want to hang on to. Oh, I can't give this up. Oh, no, this is very important to me. Oh, I've had this all my life. Mm-mm, mm-mm. You've got to get converted. you got to, because you're still hanging on. Dead men don't hang on to anything. Isn't that right? Dead people don't own anything. Yeah. And life's a lot easier. <laughs> Dead people have no problems. <laughs> yes. So, you know, first you make your choices, then your choices make you. So you've got to be careful about your choices, who you're hanging with, what you're wearing, what you're eating, what you're watching, what you're listening to, because you make the choices, and then choices start making you. And the day you choose to sin is your last free choice. From then on, you're under bondage. The day you choose sin is your last free choice. Boy, when I heard that statement, oh, that struck. That's true. When I choose sin, I have lost my freedom because now I'm a servant of the devil. I'm no longer free. Yes. I like this too. God does not require us to give up anything that is for our best interest to retain, does he? No, he's not a spoil sport. He's not a party pooper. He doesn't ask you to give up anything that's not for your best. The only thing you're giving up are what's gonna hurt you and others. That's what he asks you to give up, what's gonna hurt you and others. That's all he ever asks. And so when I saw these things disappearing, I was saying, you know, that's really, all that was doing was hurting hurting me and others. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him. I have a whole sermon entitled Joy. In fact, it will be made available on some discs uh, um, Sunday if you're interested. But Because I figured joy is what most Christians are missing. They don't have joy. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. The next fruit of the Spirit after love, and that's God, right? Love is God. So right after God, God says, right after me, love, I want you to have joy. So it must be pretty high on his list, isn't it? Yes. And that's why I wrote a whole sermon on joy, because I figured this has got to be up there. It's right after God. He says, I want you to have joy. But too many Christians don't have joy. You know, they're focusing on the world, they're listening to the devil, and they're doing all the things that take away all their joy. And so they don't have joy. That's why I've discovered in my travels the Mad Venice, Bad Venice, and Sad Venice. And one little group called the Glad Venice. They're the ones who got joy. So I said, I gotta write a sermon on this because they got us outnumbered. <laughs> we need to strengthen ourselves. So, no real joy can be found in the path forbidden by God who knows what is best and who plans for their good. The path of transgression is a path of misery 
and destruction. All heaven is interested in the happiness of man. Yeah, he's interested in your happiness. Shun those indulgences that would bring suffering and disappointment. The true joyous life of the soul is to have Christ formed within the hope of glory. How does Christ get formed within? Your Bible study and your prayer. That's how he's formed within. And then I talked to you about this uh, last night, about the true force of the will, your power of choice. Remember we said last night that when you're making a choice, there are two parts of the brain that are activated. The high part of the brain, which is your intellect, your conscience, and your reason. And then the low part of your brain, which is appetite, desire, and passion. And we said there was nothing wrong with appetite, desire, and passion. God gave us that. But it can't have the final decision and the controlling power of your choice. Reason, intellect, and conscience has to be activated before you make the final choice. Because as I said, first you make your choices, then your choices make you. So we have to be careful that we're using the high part of mind. This is called your frontal lobe. Do you know no other creature on this earth has a larger frontal lobe for the size of their brain than humans? Our frontal lobe is one third of our brain. No other creature has that, that their frontal lobe is one third of their brain. This is what makes us created in the image of God. This is our morals, our standard, our reasoning between right and wrong, our frontal lobe right here. And so Satan is after this. And the way he circumvents it, and if you study this out, and we need to study this, we need to be teaching it more to our young people. When you watch television, your frontal lobe shuts down. Did you know that? They know that for a fact. You see, they can monitor the brain, and they can see you have an electrical current that goes in the brain. I don't know if you know this or not. And they can tell what's firing and what's not, what part of the brain is active and what part of the brain is sleeping. Within um, some say 30 seconds, I think it might be a little longer, but within 30 seconds after the TV or the movie goes on, there is no electrical firing going on here. This is dead, your frontal lobe. And that's why you can accept and believe and enjoy everything that happens next because you have no guard saying, hey, this is wrong. This is immoral. This is violent. You shouldn't be watching this. No, it's shut down. It's like hypnosis. Um, and there's a whole science behind this. If you watch Little Light Studios, you can go on YouTube. These guys used to work for Walt Disney. I know them personally. Scott is a friend of mine. And he said, yeah, we used to work for Disney. And then when we got converted, we realized what Disney was doing, and now we exposed them. And so if you go on Little Light Ministry, you will see all the Disney. The one I know Rome recently they just did was this thing called Frozen. It's about some silly little girl. But that song that was in that movie was the number one most popular songs among young girls. They, they sang it everywhere they were at. They knew this song. They bought the little costumes to look like Frozen. This Frozen person was a very bad person. Do what you will. That was her motto. There are no rules. You do what you will. And you know who says that, don't you? That's Satan that's saying that. That's not from heaven. Heaven never says, do what you will. Yeah, but Frozen was teaching our young girls, you know, you want to be, you want to be the it girl, be the Frozen girl. Yeah, you're going to be frozen six feet under. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. So make sure the high part of the brain is functioning, and you're making good choices. By yielding yourself. In your will to Christ, you ally yourself with power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast, and thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. Wow, isn't that wonderful? One of the prayers I taught the academy kids, because we recited it every night. The first night I had it spelled out on the screen, and we would say it over and over, and then I had just the first letter of each word put up there and see if they could go through it. And so every night we were saying this prayer. It's one of the most precious prayers that I use often. I don't think a month goes by that I don't pray this prayer. It's similar to the one that David wrote in Psalm 139. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. 
see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, this prayer is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 159. And it says, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. I told those kids, I want you to memorize this, and that's why we're going to say it every night during this week of prayer. I want you to memorize this is a fallback prayer when you're in trouble. You just recite this prayer. And even though you may not understand it or fully believe it, you just keep saying it. You just keep saying it. Because the Bible principle will help you. As you behold, you will become changed. You will be able to accept it. You will be able to receive it and to live it. Very important. I got five minutes left, so obviously we're not going to do another chapter. But I can tell you some Steps to Christ stories. I have lots of Steps to Christ stories. And I can keep you here till midnight telling Steps to Christ stories. But let me tell you uh, one of them. Page 159. Uh -huh. C-O-L. Yeah. Memorize that prayer. I'm telling you, this is a, that's a powerful prayer to pray when you're feeling overwhelmed. You just lay that prayer out to God and say, I don't understand it. I can't fully uh, receive it, but I'm saying it. And this is my cry. This is what I'm asking. And he'll accept it. He'll accept it. So, steps to Christ. I was going on a prayer walk. Um, I, I was uh, doing some missionary work in Key West, Florida. I don't know if some of you know um, Nita, Juanita Kratchmar. She had this theater of the universe thing going on in Florida. And uh, so I went there to uh, spend some time with him to see how the project was going and if I had anything to offer. But on my days off, I would go on prayer walks. And I actually came by two churches that were side by side to each other a Methodist church, and a Baptist church. And I thought, oh, this is perfect, because on my website, I have letters of recommendations from the Methodists and the Baptists that my seminars are good to go, that you should show it at your Methodist church and your Baptist church. So I'll, I'll tell you one of them tonight, because I, we did, I did both of them. This was a double hitter <laughs> when I went to this. Uh, I went to the Methodist one first, because I have more letters from the Methodists. I taught at the Methodist seminary. I taught Methodist ministers, and the president of that seminary wrote me an outstanding letter that's on my website. So when I want to go to a Methodist church, and I've noticed you've got a number of them around here, all I have to do is take that letter and say, um, I, I taught at your seminary. Would you like to have a seminar here? I taught your Methodist ministers, and this is the president of the seminary. Is your brain clicking? You should be saying, when can you start? <laughs> so I went to the Methodist lady, and the door was open ajar. So I walked inside. I said, hello. And a voice came back. She goes, yes, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for the minister. She said, oh, that would be me. And she came around the corner, big fluffy lady. And uh, I said, oh, I said, well, I said, actually, I think I can, I can help your congregation. She said, my congregation, what do you do? I said, well, I teach New Start. It's health seminars. She goes, oh, how does that work? I said, well, do your... Congregation have trouble sleeping at night? Do they have trouble with weight control, uh, diabetes, uh, cholesterol? She goes, yes, 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 yes. And I said, well, I can help them. She says, I need help. <laughs> she said, sit down. So I showed it to her. And she goes, yep, this is great. We're going to have this one. I said, listen, do you do anything with the Baptist across the street? And she goes, oh, all the time. She said, look, tell Mike, either he's having it or I'm having it. But we're having the seminar. And so I already had a shoe in with Mike. I said, Mike, Pastor Greer said we're having it. <laughs> do you want it at your church or her church? You get a choice. He says, she has a better sound system. Let's do it at her church. So I'll tell you the Methodist one another time. But the Baptist one, um, uh, I made the announcement the following Sunday at the Methodist church, and I ran across the parking lot into the Baptist church, and I made the announcement again. So I stayed there for the worship service. And at the end of the church service, a pastor came up to me, introduced himself, and he said, you know, we're really looking forward to this seminar. I think it's going to be great. And he said, but I want you to meet somebody. And I said, sure. So he introduced me to a lady who was the prison chaplain. And I said, oh, really? I said, you're in charge of the prison. She goes, yes. And I said, oh, I said, I, I like speaking it to the inmates. Um, I'd like to come and give a health presentation there because it's part of the problem of why they're making bad choices is because their brain and their body isn't well. And she says, oh, yes. Yeah, if you'd like to come, we could have you as a guest speaker. Uh, what church do you go to? 
well, I try to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And I say, well, I'm in a different church almost every month. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> and then she said, what church were you baptized in? I almost said I was christened a Roman Catholic because of my father. But I decided I would own up. And I said, well, I'm baptized as Seventh-day Adventist. And you can see the ice go over her face. And she looked at me and she goes, you got 15 minutes. And I said, okay, what time? She said, Tuesday, 7 o'clock, 15, that's it. And I said, I got you. So that next Tuesday, I showed up, 7 o'clock. I got up. She, she said, uh, this man made an announcement at my church. We're doing a health seminar. So I invited him to come to talk to you for 15 minutes. <laughs> I got you. Heil Hitler. <laughs> so I got up there, and I started talking. My 15 minutes were just about up. She stood up in the back, and she went. So I did another 15 minutes, got ready to sit down. She stood up in the back and she went. I did another 15 minutes. She jumped up. She went. <laughs> An hour later, she got up front. She said, gentlemen, what do you think? Yeah, this is great. We wish we'd have known this as teenagers. Man, we like this. And she said, Paul, could you come back next week and take the entire time? And I said, I'd be happy to. And she says, all right, gentlemen, he will be back. And we'll get for the entire time. So when they dismissed him to go back to their cells, I told her, I said, you know, I'd like to bring a, a case of Steps to Christ. So each one of these men could have that. Would it be all right with you if I brought a case of Steps to Christ? She said, Paul, you can bring anything you want to these men. After what I saw tonight, I know you're God's man. And so I called the ABC right away, ordered two cases of Steps to Christ, had them delivered, and then I brought them to the... Uh, the jail that night and spoke to the guy again and uh, they were so excited to get steps to Christ because you see they had confidence in me if I say this is the book after the Bible they want it and why did they have confidence with me because they heard what I said about health and it rang clear to them they got it they said this is what's keeping me in prison I've got so much junk food I'm doing junk stuff I am poisoning myself with music and movies, and I'm living that kind of life and getting arrested for it. And I'm trying to make this all clear to them. I said, you guys get this? Are you under? Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, we got it. We got it, brother. Yeah. So anyway, made my final presentation, and she got up. And she said, gentlemen, I have a, a confession and an apology to make to you. Because of my prejudice and my ignorance, you almost never got to see Paul. When he told me he was a Seventh-day Adventist, I tried to get rid of him. And I told him he could only have 15 minutes. And I was hoping he would say, well, that's really not enough. Thank you anyway. But Paul, because he's such a missionary for God, he said, I'll take it. Anything he could get, he'll take. And so she said, you've got to hear him. I am so grateful that he did not give me up the way I gave him up. But he came. And because he came, she turned to me and she says, Paul, whenever you come to Key West, this is your prison, and you will always be the speaker here when you arrive. How did I get into that prison? The health message. Hello. Yes. I can't tell you how many Sunday churches I have spoken at because of the health message. Police department, fire department, prisons, drug rehabilitation centers, prisons, you name it. The health message, we are told, is the entering wedge and after pastoring two churches i said i need a bigger wedge i said if i walk up and say i'm a seventh adventist pastor slam as fast as i get that last word out but if i say i can help you lower your cholesterol sleep better at night i can help you to lose weight i can help you how do you do that and now what we're emphasizing is how to build up your immune system you know what it's the exact same lecture <laughs> It's the exact same lecture. Drink your water, get to bed, exercise, eat the right food. Your immune system is going to boost up. So we're just entitling it how to, how to build up and maintain your immune system. Oh, yes, yes, we need that now. Yes, COVID. So COVID just opened the door wider for me. Yeah. Once these restrictions lift, in, in North Dakota, in every, I've been in Montana, North Dakota, North Carolina. I can't get into the colleges because of COVID. Non-faculty are not allowed to come and speak right now. And I can't get into the high schools. 
and I can always get into the high schools because I'm a silver medalist. Uh, some of you may not know this, but I'm a silver medalist in the World Senior Games in the five kilometer, 1500 meter races. So all I have to do is call the football and basketball coach and I'm on that campus. The principal, he takes too long. He practically wants the doctor who delivered me to show up. <laughs> but now I don't have to come up with anything other than those medals. Those are the key that will get me into that school. And once that teacher sees how important this is and how much is, he'll call the health education teacher and say, you need this guy to speak at your students. We need to have a whole school assembly. And when I go to Europe, the entire school is canceled and brought into the assembly hall because those teachers realize the value this is to their students, which is why their students are ahead of the American students. You know that, don't you? The teachers in the European schools are very protective and on the cutting edge for their students. When I walk into a European classroom, as soon as they see the professor walk through the door, all talking stops immediately. There is not another word that comes out of that student's mouth until he raises his hand and the professor recognizes him. They believe in order. They believe in respect for authority. And so when I walk into a European classroom, as soon as they see me or I come in with the, the teacher, they immediately stand up, stand by their desk like this, and they wait. I can fool around with my papers. I can erase the chalkboard. They don't move a muscle. They stand like this. And then when I look at them and I nod my head, they sit down, open up their books, get out their paper, and grab their pen. They do not talk to each other. They do not joke, laugh, fool around, jump out of their seats, nothing. They're watching you because they're to learn. And that's why they exceed the American student. Yes, because the teachers established order and rule and respect. And when you have that, the students will want to learn because they know you mean business and you're there to help them. And they can see that in the way you treat them. Yes, you say, oh, it's, that's too restrictive. No, young people love parameters set because they feel safe. They know where the limits are. And so you understand this. I don't know where these people are getting their education training in the United States. It's just gone down the toilet with Drano on top of it. Makes me sad, makes me sad. Well, I taught at a huge high school in Czechoslovakia, and they used the word on me. I didn't know what it was, but it's the word for teaching skills. What is that called? Pedagog pedagogy? Pedag it's a big word. I don't know what it was, but they knew it. They said, where did, where did you get that? They said, you know, you held every one of our students, hundreds of them spellbound in an auditorium. How did you do that? And I said, I think there's a book that might help you. And they said, we want that book. What is it? Education by Ellen G. White. Read that book. You'll have a better school and you'll have better teachers. Boy, they wrote that down and they said, we, we are getting that book. Yeah. It's all there. Just read it. Want a better home? I've had people ask me to do their weddings. I said, no, don't even talk to me until you've known each other a year. And don't even talk to me until you've read Adventist Home out loud together. Because Adventist Home will cover all the things that you really need to understand about each other before you get married. Because if you learn about it after, it can end up in divorce. I didn't know you were like, I didn't know you thought that way. That's not how I believe. Well, read Adventist Home out loud together. And before I do the wedding, show me the book. I want to see those pages marked. Because I want you to have the least struggle and disappointment in your marriage as possible. And Adventist Home will do that. I don't know why we're not required reading for any marriage. It should be required reading for every marriage. We would have left as, you know, our divorce rate is equal now with the world. We're at about 50% now. I'm sorry, I got off track here and I'm after eight o'clock. So you can tell I get excited about some things. I get excited because Laodicea is so stinking Laodicea and I can't stand it. I feel like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. This is just killing me. Why? Because I read the books. My degree is in religion. I read these books and I'm looking at what we're doing. And I'm saying, what is going on here? You do not match the books at all. We need to line up to the books. And then we will come out of Laodicea. Because we are going to have to come out of Laodicea. We have to before Jesus comes back. It's the last church, but we got to pass through it. But right now, we are smack deep in the middle of Laodicea. And there's no question in my mind. I've been to too many schools, too many churches. Do you know I'm getting to the point now where I turn down weeks of prayer? Because the students are so disrespectful that I just, I'm not going to insult the word of God or myself to do that. I have pastor friends who've told me even 10 years ago, I don't do weeks of prayer anymore. And I said, really, why not? And they said, you know why? Yeah. 
I was at one school, second day of the week of prayer, I canceled it. I said, I'm done, thank you very much, and I left. And the principal called me up, trying to chew me out. And I said, you go video those kids and you tell me you wanna to talk to something like that. It's disrespectful. And I'm not talking about me personally, they're disrespecting God. And I'm not gonna to talk to anybody and waste my time, cast my pearls before swine who are gonna do something like that Amen. to the word of God. They're not allowed, I will not allow it. I will not participate in, a, in an activity like that. <laughs> well, well, well. Yeah, I said, when was the last time you read the book Education? I think you closed it a long time ago and you forgot what was in there because you do not have kids that are supposed to be in that book Education. Those are not your kids. Those books are not, those kids are not following the book Education because you're not showing it to them. Anyway, was that, that's all off the air, isn't it? <laughs> was that on Zoom? He's not saying anything. <laughs> We better have closing prayer before I get sent to Siberia. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for these steps to Christ. And Lord, if we're not taking steps to Christ, we know we're taking steps to the world. And just like you asked Adam, where are you? Who told you? Um, did you eat this fruit? What is this that you have done? And Lord, we want to have the right answers. And those, book, those answers are found in the book Steps to Christ. Thank you that we can take our steps to Christ every day. In Christ's name, amen.